That's so right. Fact, so the fact that, that 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 God placed the person said, if you do work on on Shabbat, you're gonna die. Then it creates a central theme, which is don't light a fire, and then it lists all these different works that you do to create the Mishkan. So all the different works that it took to create the Mishkan. This is the work that we don't do in terms of category, right? So sowing, for example, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, toiling soil, turn, you know, moving things that aren't needed for somebody. All these different things are, 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 are connected to um, this idea of what we're not supposed to do on Shabbat. And I'm just saying that to, to bring honor to the sages because a lot of people think we just made this stuff up and it's Excellent. just random. Go ahead, go ahead. Excellent point. If, if I could interject, I, I want to add and, and just go back to verse one, right? Verse one reads, Hallelujah. Why uh, Moshe et kol adat bene Yisrael, Wayomer alehem ele had varim ashir ziwa adonai la asot otam. Now, one, two, three, four, five. The first five words are remarkably significant for me, right? Why Moshe et kol adat. You'll notice here that the creator doesn't simply say, uh, gather the children of Israel, gather the people of Israel, but he says, call adat, which is the assembly or the congregation. That term adat is rooted in the Hebrew term ada, which means a witness, and it also means testimony. So this is not just an assemblement of peoples, an assemblement of or gathering of, of a nation. But this is a, a gathering of a people that serve as a witness and testimony of the presence of the one and true God in the world. That's highly significant. We almost can't even comb past here without making sure that we point that out because it doesn't simply say again, gather uh, all of the children of Israel, but it says, call a dot, the assembly, the assembly of whom? Of my witnesses, even as uh, Isaiah says in Isaiah 43, 10, ye are my witnesses, says the Lord, your God, right? We are the witnesses, right? This is so impactful, so significant. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go on a little bit more. So it says, gather unto me, um, or gather Moshe, all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, these are the things which the Lord commanded you to do. Verse two says, Sheshet Yamim, Te ase melacha. That's interesting. Sheshet yamim, six days. Te ase melacha. You shall do work. I want to point something out, Rob, that I'm sure you will find uh, full agreement for. The form of the verb te ase is not necessarily saying you shall do work. That's why if everyone notices, Safaria's translation is not you shall. It says work may be done. Why does it say work may be done as opposed to saying you shall do work? Because the form of the verb te'ase is in the passive stem in Hebrew. It's in the nifal stem, which is a passive Hebrew verb stem. So it's not saying six days you have to work. This is not a commandment, in other words, where the creator is telling us you got to work for six days, where Israelites are now saying, oh, my God, I got to have an occupation that lasts six days. No, the form of the verb is in the passive, the nifal stem. So it's actually saying six days work may be done. And then there's this interesting term here, right? For work, melacha. What is that? When the Torah typically speaks of work, the way that we understand work, have an occupation, the Torah employs the term avoda, right? Rooted in the Hebrew word aved, servant, right? My name, avdiel, aved. When we typically think of work, especially in terms of an occupation, the Torah's word for that is avoda. What's this word, melacha? So the sages denote that melacha is creative work. It is also work, but it is creative work. And it, this alludes to and refers to what is regarded in the oral tradition as the 39 categories of forbidden labor on the Shabbat. The 39 things that we are forbidden to do that are considered creative work. That's highly significant to point out as well. It goes on to say, six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day, or hashvi'i, yiye, there shall be lachem to you, chodesh, shabbat, shabbaton. Chodesh, holy, shabbat, the Sabbath, shabbaton. A day of holy, complete rest, shabbaton. 
La Adonai, to the Creator, Kol Haose Bo Melacha Yumat, whosoever or anyone that does in it, Bo in it, Melacha Yumat, will be put to death in the infinitive, right? Will be put to death. I heard one rabbi say just recently that we shouldn't always take the form of the verb yumat literally as in this person literally has to die because sometimes yumat in the Torah doesn't refer to a physical death. It can refer to a spiritual death. It can refer to a, a characteristic death as in if somebody takes your name and smears it across the world, they have just killed effectively your character. So the sages point out, Kazal points out in this verse that there's a number of ways that we can look at this. And one of the ways that we can look at this is the sages say, if within a 70 year span, a single person was executed by the Beit Din, then that Beit Din would have been considered a murderous Beit Din, which means then that we take killing someone extremely serious in our culture, in our way of life. People are not just put to death without warnings without, you know, being spoken to before, becoming before the judges and being, you know, crucially warned about their behavior. So yes, this is talking about killing, but we shouldn't always understand that that has to mean that this comes without some form of warning. Um, the floor is yours, uh, Rav. Please do continue. That, that we experience. But one of the children that's also connected to this is, 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 is a gentleman in verse 34 he brings another gentleman named Ve'ahaliav, right? Ve'ahaliav, and he's a son. So, you know, what I'm you see this on verse thirty-four. Yeah, he's Ve'ahaliav. He's the son of um, Achishamach, Achishamach, and he's from the tribe of Dan, right? So, the tribe of Dan is verse thirty-four. So he brings God brings Beitzalel. And he also brings this this gentleman named um, uh, uh, um, Ahali Ahali uh, Ahali Av, right? Ahali Av, yeah, Ahali Av, and he's a son, and he's a, and he's connected to the the tribe of Dan, right? And so Dan was the byproduct of Billa, who was the handmaid of Rachel, right? And over here, Beit Salel is is. Is 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 connected to, um, um, to to Levi, right? He's connected to he's he's conne no he's connected to sorry he's connected to Yehuda, right? Which is connected to Leah, right? And so you see even here the two dynamics of needing a person who can build. They say that they, they say that he he was building the 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 lower aspects of the the the. the the, the tabernacle, the Mishkan, this this, this yes. person, and then and then and then you have um, Beit Alel who was building the higher parts. So that's it's just, right. It, it's showing this this this, this participation um, even through the the maid servant of Rachel, like and and you still see the dynamic even with Leah. So you, it's just something like little things like this you could pick up and um, get a lot out of it. Oh yeah, I, I think. Another interesting parallel here uh, about the builders is later on in history, these tribes are replicated to actually produce the Beit HaMikdash, right? Yes. Or, or the, the, the Jerusalem temple, King Solomon's temple. King Solomon uh, hails from the line of Yehuda by way of uh, Melech Dawid, but look who he works alongside, Hiram. In the book of um, Chronicles, Second Chronicles, it notes that Hiram's mother was from the tribe of Dan. So it's an interesting parallel to notice that with the Mishkan, the tabernacle built in the wilderness, you have one from the tribe of Judah, Beit Salel, and you also have one from the tribe of Dan. This is replicated now again in the Jerusalem temple with Solomon and Hiram, right? Judah again working with Dan. So again, there's so much that can be said, but just needing in this moment to point out what should be an interesting parallel because we know that Hashem does nothing haphazard or coincidentally. Everything stated here is by what we would say divine design. 
And it is our objective as the readers and even as the practitioners to find out why that is, right? Even as you eloquently uh, looked at the names, I often tell people that there are several characters in the Bible that were introduced to their name, and that's not the name that their mama called them. That's not the name they were born with. These are later scribal names, right? So that means we have to look for the deeper meaning in everyone's name, right? More than any book of the entire Torah, more than any book of the entire Tanakh, the one book that points towards the point I'm making now the most is the book of Exodus, which is called in our tradition, Shemot, names. It is the names mentioned all throughout the book of Shemot, the book of Exodus, that has huge impact in terms of us understanding and discerning what's being mentioned. So there are, again, there are several characters who this may not be their birth name, but the scribes are giving them these names because there's something being related in these names. For instance, the name that you mentioned, a holy have, right? Well, that's a compound or a contraction of Ohel Av, the tent of my father, right? In reference to Hashem, this person plays a role in building Ohel Hashem, the tent of the creator or the tent of Av, my father. Then you have Ben Achi Samach. Achi, my brother, Samach, laid. There is no rabbi that doesn't become a rabbi unless he goes through what's called semicha, someone laying their hands. So this Achi Samach, this brother of someone who had divine inspiration upon him, all of this for me, Rabbi Pinchas, is saying so much because, I mean, in my humility, let me just say this. The tabernacle and the temple yeah, they're great, but they're just edifices, right? They're just structures, right? No, because when you look at the skill set that the creator is endowing, everyone that's involved in the building of this edifice, they're not just acquiring worldly knowledge because it should take worldly knowledge to construct and build edifices. But why does it take being filled with the Ruach Elohim? Why does it take chokmah, bina, da'at? Why does it take wisdom, knowledge, and understanding? And we're not speaking of worldly wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. We're speaking of divine wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, which should tell us at this point that whatever is being constructed is meant to parallel something that is metaphysical, something that is beyond the material realm something that is on a plane that cannot be defined by human standards and terms. So this becomes extremely important because one of the things about whether we're looking at the Mishkan, which is related to the Hebrew word Shekan or Shekinah, denoting the divine presence of the creator, whether we're talking about the Mikdash, which is related to the Hebrew word Chadash, a place of holiness, anytime we step in that, we're stepping in the presence of Hashem. Hence, he refers to the, the temple as the place of my stool, right, where, where I rest my feet. And this is where the presence of Hashem can be experienced and be felt. And in order for that be, to be possible, this place has to be built in a way that it perfectly, in some way, shape, and form, is fit for my dwelling. Rav Mordecai? Beautiful. I, 